Hello, and welcome back to Gaming 101 with Mr. Burger. Now, I'm going to do a video today that I've been really excited about making. This is definitely representative of kind of the direction that I want to go with this channel, which is, you know, giving kind of beginner tips that definitely will be beneficial to intermediate and advanced players alike. So what I want to do tonight is go over a bunch of terminology that I think would be helpful to beginner players. Now again, this is something that you might find beneficial if you're an intermediate player, and you know it could even be good to review it if you're an advanced player. So especially if you're an advanced player, go ahead and give me a heads up on what you think I left out, what do you think is really important as far as terminology and important terms for beginners go, and I'll try to include that in another video. Alright, so we're going to go over a couple things today, well quite a few things actually. First things first, I've been messing around with the software that I use to record, and that is OBS. So what I finally figured out how to do is uh, set up a nice little scene transition here. So I'm going to transition us into another scene here where I can take a look, or we can take a look rather, at a bullet point list that I have set up for some of the things that I want to talk about today. So let's uh, skim through everything really quickly, and then I'll get into the details. So I'm going to go over four major deck archetypes. Now keep in mind these aren't necessarily all of the major deck archetypes. These are just four ones that I think are important and you know would be beneficial to learn about. So first of all, we're going to talk about beatdown, talk a little bit about cycle, then control, and then chip and bait. After that, we'll talk about some minor deck archetypes. And again, these aren't all the minor deck archetypes. This is just my personal categorization. So we'll talk about some defensive archetypes, um, some more specific ones like Lava Loon and Minor Poison, and then of course Hog Cycle, which is a more specific example of the major cycle archetype. And then Siege. Now this could possibly be considered a major archetype as well, but you know, we'll put it in there for now. After that we're going to talk about some win conditions and I'm going to do my best to kind of define what a win condition is, because that's definitely an important term to learn for beginners. Once we get done with that, I'm just going to go over some other terminology that I think is kind of important or would be beneficial to learn. Um, we'll talk about defensive and counter push cards, some support cards, tank cards, spell cards, pocket cards, what an elixir trade is, what having an elixir advantage means, and lastly, BMing. Alright, so let's go ahead and get back to the top here and look at some decks. So what we have here in display is definitely a great example of a beatdown deck. And that's the first thing that we're going to be talking about. So this is our first major archetype, is a beatdown deck. So in a beatdown deck what you're doing basically is you're choosing a tank, right? Um, usually a heavier tank, and I'll define tank a little bit later. So for now, let's look at the Giant. Giant's a nice big troop who just goes straight for the tower and takes a lot of damage, doesn't hit any enemy troops, just kind of smacks on the tower if he can get up to it. So you something like the Giant, or I really like the Golem if you have him available. I just don't have him leveled up on this account. But let's look at his tournament level standard hit points. He's got over 4,000 hit points, so he's one of the tankiest units in the game. So you got your tank, right? And then you want to set it up with some support. So I've got archers in here, which are great support cards for almost any deck. Baby Dragon goes well with Tornado, and those both fit pretty well into a beatdown deck. So let's go ahead and move on to another style of deck, which, be, which would be a cycle deck. Now, there's a lot of different types of cycle decks. But the idea behind a cycle deck is to essentially have one or two win conditions, and then you're going to try to play a bunch of really cheap cards. And in doing so, you're able to play your win conditions quicker than your opponent can play their counter for your win condition. So I'm not going to play this replay, but let's just look at the deck that I have here. You've got the Hog, which is my main win condition. And then you've got two or three really cheap cards. The Ice Spirit only costs one. The Bats only cost two. The Zap only costs two. So as long as you've got like three-ish cards that are really cheap that only cost like one or two Elixir, that's technically a cycle deck. 
because it allows you to cycle back into your main card, your hog, a lot quicker. You can also cycle back into defensive cards and things like that. Now if we look at one of my other decks here, let's see, I think it was number one. This is what um, I would consider like a mortar cycle. So again, you've got your Ice Spirit, he only costs one. Bats only cost two. And you got a couple other cheap cards as well. Archers and Knight also only cost three. Log only costs two, so on and so forth. And your Mortar would be your main win condition in this cycle deck. Alright, so the next thing that I want to move on to would be a control deck. Now control decks are interesting. I'm not too sure how I feel about putting them in a major archetype. But they're more like you would play defensively. And you would kind of try to counter push. And benefit from that. That whole style of play. So you kind of play on defense. Try to gain control of the battle. Counter push and win that way. This is kind of an example of a control deck here, this Royal Giant deck that I played in my last video. Um, but I could probably come up with another better example. Uh, I really like this classic, I think it's a Minor Poison Electro Wizard and it's got Inferno Dragon, or Inferno Tower in there rather. That's a really good control deck. And of course you throw in your support and your cycle and whatever else you want to play in there. Alright, the next thing that we're going to be talking about is the Chip or the Bait deck. Now, these two go hand-in-hand in, hand in a way, but they're also a little bit different. The one that we're looking at here is an example of a bait deck. And I include those two together because it has chip elements in this deck. So, bait, I talked about this a little bit in my last video, but essentially what you're doing is you're trying to bait out their spells by using more than one card that is susceptible to their spells. So most decks are going to run like a log, like this card right here. So, you got your princess, you got your goblin gang, you got your dark goblin and you got your Goblin Barrel. Now in Classic Bait, you'd switch out the Dark Goblin with the Ice Spirit, but I'm just putting Dark Goblin in there for the fun of it. So if he uses his Log on, say, your Princess, now you can safely toss your Goblin Barrel out at his Princess Tower, and thus you have baited out his Log, and it's allowed you to kind of gain a really large advantage if you continue to do that. Um, I also consider it a chip deck because you have a lot of little bit of little chippy kind of cards, you know? You got the Dark Goblin, you can place him at the bridge, and he'll just run up and get off like three or four shots before he dies, and before they can react. If you put your Princess at the bridge, she definitely gets off one shot almost every single time, unless they preemptively like predict it, and they put their log down before you even, you know, manage to put your Princess down, before they could even possibly see it. And sometimes professional players will do that. They'll know, okay, he's going to put the Princess there, so I'll put my log down right now. But, you know, that has room to mess up and cost you a bunch of extra elixir that you don't want to waste. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to some more minor deck archetypes. Why don't we switch back to my cool little document screen here. So we talked about these four major deck archetypes, and I want to talk about some minor deck archetypes. Now, I cannot stress this enough. These aren't official, all right, guys? These are just kind of like my personal opinions of them. Um, but we'll talk about them nonetheless, and I think a lot of people would agree that you could fit a lot of these into this category. So one of the first ones that I want to talk about is the defensive or the reactive archetype. It's kind of similar to a control deck, and I explained that a little bit earlier. It's about playing defensively with defensive cards, which I'll explain more in detail later, and reacting and using those defensive cards to counter push and control the game, control the board, or the map, or whatever you might want to call it. Um, then we have some more specific minor archetypes. We got our Lava Loon. So let's look at the Lava Hound. Now I don't have Lava Hound on this account, but on my main account I actually have level 3 Lava Hound. This is my first level 3 Legendary, my only one at the moment. So the Lava Hound is a big tanky air unit. He's not so great right now, but he definitely still has potential. Um, he only is really used in one archetype. You rarely see him in anything else other than Lava Loon. So you put the Lava Hound in the way back of the map, then you grab your nifty balloon here, put him right behind the Lava Hound as he's crossing the bridge. The Lava Hound soaks up all the damage as any good tank should, similar to like a beatdown deck. Lava Hound is definitely another tank in the beatdown deck. And then the balloon just kind of sneaks by in the back and annihilates the tower. Uh, if you know anything about a balloon, one hit takes out like a third of the tower's health. It's something crazy. Plus it has death damage, which is pretty significant since it got nerfed or buffed a while back. Uh, another good archetype I would like to talk about 
would be the Minor Poison. Now, I really like Minor Poison. This is one of my favorite. So I'd love to pull up a video here if I can. Let me see. I know it's a ways up. I think I went too far. Okay. Well, Minor Poison is really strong um, for a number of reasons. It definitely would fit into the category of uh, chip deck and it has potential for bait as well. Um, let's take a look at this deck that I'm running here. I got Miner, I got Poison, I got the Skeleton Barrel. Skeleton Barrel's new at this point and it goes really well with Miner Poison. Um, the idea behind Miner Poison, we'll just kind of skim through this replay really quickly, we don't have to watch the whole thing. But the idea behind it is very similar to Control. You want to play defensively and then you want to counter push with your you know defensive counter push cards and then you send in your miner as your other units are pushing you know as they're like about to cross the river basically and your miner will go up to the bridge or I'm sorry up to the tower and tank for it while your other units are crossing so if we look at this example here the mega minion is going to go in I send in the miner I put down the poison now the mega minion doesn't make it all the way to the tower because of course he countered it with his knight but regardless, you can kind of get the concept of how I sent it in and it tanked for it for a while. And if he hadn't reacted to that, it would have done a ton of damage. Now, another good thing about the minor poison decks is that you've got something really reliable that allows you to continually, continually pump out damage onto one of their towers. Um, the minor poison combo is really cheap. You send in your miner, they're probably going to counter it with something like a skeleton army, a minion horde, a goblin gang, you know, something that's swarmy. Most of the time, not always and you put down your poison right as the miner arrives and the poison takes care of all of that immediately and they've wasted elixir in doing so. Even if they put down like a musketeer or a wizard or an electro whiz, the poison will do almost enough damage to kill it at tournament level standard. Um, if your poison is higher level than their you know, wizard or musketeer or whatever, then it'll actually kill it. Alright, so you can see I'm slowly chipping away at this deck here. This video is almost over. I know it's going to be really close, so we'll finish it up. I think he like arrows me right as I send my miner in or get my poison off at the end here. Yeah, there it is. All right, cool. So that was a really good replay. That's one that I wanted to show of one of my favorite deck archetypes. Okay, let's get back to my decks here. The next thing that I'm going to talk about will be Hog Cycle. Now, Hog Cycle is an example of a cycle deck. And as I mentioned before, cycle decks can include a multiple or various win conditions. In this case, I got the Mortar. In the sample deck that I showed earlier with my alt account, I had a Hog cycle deck with the Executioner and the uh, Tornado as kind of my support. The idea behind Hog cycle is to build up a little bit of defense, uh, not necessarily in all in all cases, um, but the idea behind it is to kind of outcycle what they have and keep sending that hog in and try to just kind of blow up their tower one step at a time. So I'm looking at a Magnite hog deck here. This isn't quite a hog cycle deck. So let's find that specific hog cycle deck. I know I have one up here that we were looking at earlier. All right, bear with me here, guys. Hog NATO Executioner Cycle. There it is. So again, you got the cheap cards, you got the uh, Ice Spirit and the Bats. So you try to play your cheap cards to counter their more expensive cards, gain an Elixir advantage, which I'll talk more about later, and keep sending that Hog in and outcycling their defense. So if they have like a classic counter of the Hog would be a Tornado or a Cannon, because they both cost less and you know pretty much shut it down. But if you can outcycle their cards, you can send another hog in before he has his counter in hand. And that's kind of the whole idea behind the hog cycle deck. Um, I definitely recommend hog cycle decks for any beginner or intermediate players. They're really good because they teach you how to play the game a little bit better because you learn how to cycle and how to counter for cheap, like for less elixir than you know what they're spending. And you know, hog is just a really powerful win condition. It always has been. I think it always will be. Just the overall mechanic of the card. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is Siege. Now, Siege is exactly two cards, Mortar or Exbow. Um, some of you might call it the Crossbow. I call it the Exbow. A lot of us in the Clash Royale community call it the Exbow. 
Um, these are your major win conditions in these decks. You just basically play them on your side of the arena, like your side of the bridge, and they shoot across to the enemy side, and they can hit their towers from there. So generally, you'll see them in cyclish decks, like the one that I have up here. But you also might see them in beatdown decks from time to time. Now, you might have some other minor deck archetypes that I didn't list here on my screen, um, such as like Spell Cycle um, or Chip and Bait. But Chip and Bait, you know, I fit that in a lot of different categories, so I'll leave that in the major deck archetype category for now. Spell Cycle was really cool, but they nerfed spell damage to towers, like for all spells in one of the recent patches, so it kind of died off as soon as it was, you know, discovered to be powerful in the meta. All right. So let's move on to the next thing that I would like to talk about, which is even more specific. So this is win conditions. Now, win condition, this is a really important term to understand. Your win condition is basically your main way of winning the game. Now, some decks feature more than one win condition. In the case of this deck right here, you've got one win condition, which is pretty much your mortar. Now you have some alternatives to win. You can win the game with a rocket, or with a princess, or even a log. But your main idea behind winning is the mortar. Obviously in the hog cycle deck, your win condition is the hog. In a beatdown deck, your win condition is your tank paired with its support. That's what you're going to use to win the game. Now let's talk about a bunch of different win conditions. An example, I'll try to give you examples of a few of them. Now I don't want to go into too much detail because I've already talked a lot, but let's go over a few. So first of all, you've got your Hog. Now Hog finds his place in Cycle and Beatdown decks. You can put him behind a tank and he's actually very effective. Uh, you can put him behind a mini tank like a Ice Golem or a Knight, or you can put, a, put him behind a big tank like a Giant. He's great in cycle decks, though. That's mostly what I play for ladder. Um, another major win condition, as I mentioned earlier, would be the giant up here, or the golem. I love me a golem. Golem is really fun to play. Um, the next one that I would like to talk about is the ram, the battle ram, and the three musketeers. Now, I put three musketeers here with the battle ram for a reason. Um, three musketeers is very susceptible to lightning. Lightning hits three units at once. So if they can manage to place it perfectly and hit all three of your three musketeers, they just spent six elixir when you spent nine. Now, let's say that your three musketeers are plopping along the map, and you put down a battle ram. Here he is. Right next to two, if not three, of your musketeers. If they lightning that, the battle ram has more health and the barbarians have more health, so that counts as a, they would call it like a lightning rod. It soaks up the lightning for the musketeers. And then they spent six elixir for something that you spent only four on. So th those two kind of go together as a win condition, but they're also both arguably a win condition in their own. Uh, the next thing that we have would be the minor poison. Now I know I talked about this already and gave an example and a replay and everything, so I don't need to talk about it anymore, but that's certainly a win condition. Those two go together very well and are a win condition in their own. Lava Loon is definitely a win condition. Lava Loon, again, is the Lava Hound, this big um, beefy guy down here, paired with the Balloon. Balloon's right here. Uh, the next win condition that I'd like to talk about after Lava Loon, let's see, what is it? Oh yeah, Siege. So Siege, as I mentioned earlier, there's two Siege cards. You got your Expo, and you got your Mortar, which is in my Mortar deck over here. And those are both win conditions in their own. Sometimes you'll even see them together. Now, another really powerful win condition is the Royal Giant. This guy right here. He's really annoying. You plop him down. He's a tank that does range damage. And he only goes for towers. So you plop him down on your side of the arena. He just walks across the bridge and gets a couple shots off on the enemy's tower before they can do anything most of the time. If they're good, they might have like an Inferno Tower in there, something that can counter him really well, and they'll place it perfectly so that he doesn't shoot the Princess Tower, he shoots the Inferno Tower instead, and it just blows them up. But even in that case, if you time it correctly and, you know, outcycle them, then you can easily, you know, get a couple shots off on their tower, and there's almost never anything they can do about it to fully shut him down. The Goblin Barrel. 
Goblin Barrel is a huge win condition for sure. He fits really well in chip and bait decks. Um, but, you know, he's also great in beatdown decks. If you put, like, your knight down, especially if you put a big tank down, if you put him in a beatdown deck with, like, the giant right here, you know, your giant or your knight walks across the river, their princess tower starts shooting your tank, and he's soaking up all the damage. Meanwhile, your goblins, if you toss your goblin barrel in right after, they're just wailing away on his tower, and goblins do an insane amount of damage. They just are really squishy. They die really easily. So if you have something tanking for them, as long as your opponent doesn't have like a spell like arrows or fireball or log that just blows your, go your goblins up, then you know they'll just annihilate a tower really quickly. Um, after that, of course, you could potentially consider the balloon by itself a win condition. You'll see him in decks sometimes with just like an ice golem or a knight, some sort of a mini tank for him. Here's the ice golem right here. Um, or even sometimes if you like outcycle your opponent or catch them off guard or put it in the other lane, you can just send in a balloon by its own and it'll get to the tower and just blow it up. Now, win conditions, a lot of decks only have one but some have more than one. In this bait deck, you can argue that the Goblin Gang, the Princess, and the Goblin Barrel, and maybe even the Dark Goblin are in a way a win condition. Or, I don't know, I would say mostly the Goblin Barrel in this case. But some decks have more than one. If you have like a Hog and a Giant in your deck, that's two win conditions right there. Or if you have Hog and Mortar, which is really popular right now, that's two win conditions right there. So make sure that all your decks have at least one, if not two, win conditions. You don't want to have too many, because then you won't have anything to support all your win conditions. If you have a bunch of units that just attack towers, then you have nothing to play defense, and they'll just plow through them and, you know, annihilate your base. Okay. Let's move on. The next thing that I would like to talk about is a bunch of other terminology. So let's go through a few of these things. Defensive and counter push cards play a role in, you know, mostly counter push decks. Um, but it's really important to understand, like, why they're, why they're powerful. Like, why are they important? Why are they so good? So let's talk about some exa examples of defensive and counter push cards. The prime example is Electro Wizard. He's been really strong ever since he was released. He's been nerfed once or twice, but he's still really strong. He's got spawn damage, which means he lands with a POW. So he stuns nearby enemies and he does damage when he lands. So as soon as he lands, it's like a zap spell. That also stuns things. So if they've got like an Inferno Dragon or Inferno Tower or a Sparky, that'll interrupt their charge. Um, not only that, but his regular auto attack stun. So, you know, that'll do the same thing. It interrupts charges. So he's really good on defense because he's got good damage. He's got that spawn damage. He stuns all these great things for defense and he's ranged. And then he just runs across the map and does a bunch of damage to their tower. Either that or they have to spend elixir of their own to take care of him. And that's the whole idea behind, you know, counter push defensive cards. So let's talk about a couple others. Giant Skeleton is a great counter push or defensive card. You pop them down on defense. You know, their um, support goes for your Giant Skeleton. And if you look at him, let's look at him at tournament level. He's got death damage and it's a lot of damage. It's almost a thousand at tournament level standard. So when he dies, a few seconds later, his bomb explodes, and he'll blow up, like, all of their offensive push. Um, especially if you plop him, like, right near the support, because they'll kill him, then they'll walk a little bit further right into his bomb. So you want to place him kind of right in front of them, and then his bomb will blow up and just annihilate them. Uh, you could definitely say that P.E.K.K.A. is another example of a counter push card. Now, it's interesting, some of these counter push cards, going back to win conditions, kind of count as pseudo win conditions. Um, so, for example, Sparky here, she's great on defense because you plop her down, she charges up, and she does insane damage. She's really easy to counter, but if they don't have a good counter in hand to her, or if you built up a big push because you, you know, used her on defense and built up an elixir advantage, then she'll just walk across and she might win the game for you. So same thing with, you know, Electro Wizard. He can walk across and win the game for you. Or P.E.K.K.A., definitely. I like to use her on defense. I've learned she's really good on defense. But if they don't answer her, man, she'll, she'll just blow a tower up. Mega Knight is another excellent example of a defensive counter push card. Because similar to the Electro Wizard, he lands with a BAM. And um, 
he does like AoE damage and it's really strong, knocks enemies back, and then they have to counter him as he walks across their side of the arena. He does cost 7, but you know, he's well worth his cost. Okay, the next thing that I would like to talk about is, oh yeah, let's talk about E-Barbs. E-Barbs are great. Elite Barbarians are another great counter push card. You put them down, they defend, they do a bunch of damage, and then they run really quickly across the enemy's um, base, or to the enemy's base, rather, and just blow up a tower if they touch it. You could argue that some of the Swarm cards, you know, like Minion Horde, or in this deck here, Goblin Gang, are defensive counter push cards. They do play a defensive role for sure. You usually don't use a Minion Horde, like, by itself on offense. You don't just place it at the bridge unless you have some insane elixir advantage or some reason to. Um, you generally use it on defense and then allow it to counter push. Um, you know, regular goblins, skeletons, bats, minions. You could say that those are defensive counter push cards, but they kind of die really easily. But you know, again, if you got like a, a knight or some sort of a tank paired with them on offense, as they defend first, you put the knight in front of them before they cross the river, and then he tanks for them, and then they run across the map and do a bunch of damage to the tower. But they are susceptible to, you know, like, zap, arrows, things like that. Alright, the next thing that I would like to talk about is support card. So what is a support card? Well, a support card is basically something that, um, well, self-describe. It supports usually your win condition. Archers are a great example of a support card. They're cheap, they're ranged, there's two of them, they do good damage, they've got a lot of advantages. Now, your archers aren't going to be your win condition. I mean, yeah, they can get a little bit of chip damage off on the tower, but you can't rely on them to win games consistently. Unlike a giant or a hog, you can rely on those guys as like your main win conditions. So archers are great examples of support cards. Musketeer is another great example of a support card. Um, these are kind of cheaper ones. Ice Wizard, I don't think I have Ice Wizard on this account, but I've got him. He was my first legendary on my main account, so my first legendary ever. Awesome support card. Pair him with a tornado, he does work. Alright. Goblins, bats, all those cheaper things I was talking about a, a minute ago, you know, those are definitely support cards as well. Then you got some more expensive support cards. Let's find us a wizard. Where's wizard? There he is. I don't have him leveled up on this account, but I do have him pretty high on my main account. That's why I don't use him on this account. You know, I figure why level him on both. I'll just play him on the one. Um... He's expensive. He costs 5, so he's expensive for a support card, but he's got really good utility. He does good AoE damage. So the Executioner kind of dethroned the wizard because he's the same. He costs 5, and he's a lot beefier. He doesn't. He's not really susceptible to like fireballs and stuff. Um, those are some more expensive ones. You could argue that the uh, Musketeer is more expensive as well, but you know she's right in the middle. She costs 4, so she's kind of intermediate. So... After that, let's talk a little bit about tank cards. Now, there's two kinds of tanks. You got your heavy tanks and your mini tanks. Prime example of the heavy tank is the golem right here. Again, looking at his tournament level standard hit points, he's got 4,256. So, like 4,300, 4,200. Let's look at some other beefy cards. Pekka at tournament level standard has 3,500, or just under that, rather. So, that's already less. Mega Knight also costs 7. He's also tanky. What's his health? 3,300, even less. So Golem is one of the beefiest units in the game. Lava Hound has even less health than him, so he's probably got the most health. A Giant is another great example of a heavy tank. They cost a lot, they got a lot of health. You know, they're kind of risky to play because they cost a lot, but they're really powerful. You've also got some mini tanks. So your main two mini tanks are going to be your Knight, who I've got right here, and your Ice Golem. I think I have him in the deck. Yeah, there he is. So Ice Golem and Knight only cost 2 and 3, respectively. And they soak up a bit of damage. Ice Golem, some people think he's cruddy because he just walks straight to the tower and does almost nothing, but that's the whole point. He's soaking up damage while your support cards, or your hog, your other you know, win condition, your main win condition, runs in and does a ton of damage. Well, their Princess Tower is just focused on your dinky little mini tank. So mini tanks are definitely really important in a lot of decks. You could argue that the Valkyrie is a mini tank, but she costs a little bit more. Um, she's making a bit of a resurgence, but she's kind of been on the down low as far as usage for a while now. Alright, let's move on to spell cards. Now spell cards are really, really important, and you want to have a few in each deck. 
Let's look at all my decks. In this deck, I've got two spell cards. In this deck, I've got three spell cards. Here, I've got two. Here, so on and so forth. This one looks like it's got two as well. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, there's a few different kinds of spell cards. We'll talk about each one. So first of all, you got your light spell cards. So spell cards are important in every deck, and you want to have usually one light and like one heavy, or one super heavy is kind of what I like to call it. Um, when I talk about light, I mean either log or zap. Log and zap both only cost two. They both only do a little bit of damage, but they are very powerful in their own way. You also want one heavier spell. Now, it's really important to note that this fireball, which is like a heavier spell, goes really well with zap and log because they kind of um, pair up and finish the job on you know medium health units like musketeer or wizard. So that being said, what happens is they play their musketeer at the back of the map, it walks up to their princess tower, you fireball it, and if they're at the same level, let's say they're both at tournament level standard, right? The uh, fireball does 572 damage, but what about the musketeer? How much health does she have? Well, let's look. She's also at level 7, which would be the same. 598, so she's got a little bit more health, so she doesn't quite die. But if you zap at the same time or right after, that'll finish the job. Now let's say they did three musketeers, and they're all in one lane, which is a bad move to begin with, but let's say that they did. You fireball and zap that, you just killed all three of their musketeers for only six elixir, which they spent nine on. So that's really important to keep in mind. You want one powerful spell, one minor or light spell, and then of course you've got some other more utility spells like you know the tornado, which I'll get into a little bit later. Tornado is really powerful. I use it in a lot of decks. Um, also, you got your super heavy spells. That's pretty much your rocket and your lightning. So the super heavy spells kill everything that I mentioned before, like the wizards and the musketeers and all those medium range support units or heavier support units. They don't kill the bowler, though. Rocket kills executioner, but does not kill bowler. And I asked my buddy, why do you use Bowler? He's kind of off meta right now, and he said he doesn't die to Rocket. I'm like, that's a good point. So keep that in mind. Tornado and Zap are a really powerful combo. If you Tornado and then Zap a minion horde, it'll just insta-kill it. Um, same thing with, you know, like Goblins. Now, on that note... You got death effects on some units, like the Ice Golem, when he dies, he does a little bit of an AoE damage, a little splash damage, similar to like a zap damage. It doesn't stun, but it slows and does AoE damage, so you can see death damage 70. Same with the Skeleton Barrel. Uh, I don't know if I have it on this account. I think I do. It should be up here in comments. There it is. It's got a little bit of death damage now, and they added that, and that's kind of what made it come into the meta. So if you have something with death damage and you send it in, it blows up, it doesn't quite kill their minion horde, but then you zap it right after, that'll kill the minion horde. So same thing for units like goblins that kind of have that same similar health pool. Now really quickly I want to talk about the difference between log and zap, because that's important to know. Now they both have their advantages. Zap is currently more popular because, I think because bats came into play. Bats are really good right now. Um, since they buffed them up to having five bats, they've been really powerful. Log doesn't hit air, but Zap does. So that's like all these little mechanics you have to think of, you know, like why is Zap really popular now? Well, because people are using bats, and they're not using log anymore because the log doesn't hit the bats because it's in the air. They're in the air, sorry. So let's talk about some more um, advantages and disadvantages. Zap stuns, which interrupts Inferno Dragon and Inferno Tower and Sparky. Um, it's quicker. You know, it, it hits there like instantly. It just zaps them rather than rolling across the map. It hits air, as I mentioned. And it's a lot easier to level. It's a common card. So if you're using it in ladder, it's definitely one that's worth requesting a lot and buying a lot to level up because you use it in a lot of decks. And if you've got like a level 13 zap, a max level zap, you'll instant kill uh, minions that are two levels lower. So you'll instant kill, kill their level 11 minions. Okay, Log, on the other hand, has a runtime, which can be an advantage and a disadvantage. So let's say you place a Hog at the bridge, right? And they're going to counter it with a Skeleton Army. 
but you send your log in right after. Your log rolls at the same speed that your hog runs, and it kills that skeleton army as they're all trying to smack it. And then you basically just spent two elixir for his three. And, you know, that's a really good thing. And not only that, now your hog has safe passage, and he doesn't have his counter in hand. So that runtime can be beneficial. It clears that path for that hog and elite barbarians and things like that. Log does do a little bit more damage. If you look at the damage, 264 at level 2 versus this is 192. Let's look at tournament level standard, actually. So 159 versus 240. So log does a lot more. Even to crown towers, it does a bit more. Log's most important aspect is that it insta-kills Princess and Dark Goblin. A lot of decks run Princess. And that's why she's uh, considered an example of Log Bait. Because they know the Log instant kills the Princess, so you use her to bait it out. Or you use something else to bait it out so that she's safe. So keep that in mind. That's a really important thing to remember for beginners. Log instantly kills Princess, instantly kills Goblins as well, kills Dark Goblins as well. It doesn't quite kill archers, so keep that in mind. Okay. So sometimes you want three or four spells depending on your deck, but usually you just want one or two. In this deck, the Royal Giant deck, that's one of the only ones where I run two light spells. I rarely ever do that. Um, but, you know, it's good in this particular deck because it helps support that Royal Giant, your main win condition. He's really susceptible to swarm cards, and you got both of those to take care of it. So you've got a couple niche spells that I want to briefly go over. For example, you got Heal, and you got Clone. Now I call these niche spells because they're not used in a lot of decks. They're only used in very few. The reason is because they're very high risk, high reward. If you place down a Heal right as they shoot a Fireball and a Zap at your Musketeers, the Fireball and Zap will just kill it and your Heal went to waste. Let's say you send in you know, um, a Minion Horde and then you clone it right before it gets to their tower. Suddenly, your 6 minions turns into 12 minions. It's about to annihilate their tower, and they do 1 zap or 1 arrows, and everything dies. And you just spent, like, what is that? That's 3 plus 5, which is 8, elixir, and they spent, like, 2 or 3. So it's high risk, high reward. They're only good in certain decks. That being said, let's say you got a golem and a lumberjack or some really good damage card at their tower already. Golem has death damage, and then you clone him. His death damage, he explodes, he gets cloned, his clone explodes, then they each turn into golemites. Now you got four golemites, and all of those explode. So even if you just get a golem by itself by the enemy's tower and you clone it, it gets it, like at least half of the tower's health down. So clone and heal and freeze and some more niche spells like that have their uses, they're just not very common. Tornado, on the other hand, is unique. It kind of takes the role of a defensive structure like a cannon because it can pull units to the middle of your side of the arena. I really love Tornado. It has a lot of uses, a lot of roles. A lot of people will agree it's really powerful and that it might even need a nerf. But let's hope not because it's one of my favorite cards. And on top of that, it makes one of the coolest sounds in the game. You should go try it out. Okay. I know this video is getting really long, so thank you for everybody who's still tuning in. I just had a whole lot of cool stuff that I wanted to cover. We're almost done here, but there's a few more things I'd like to get into. So, last thing for spells. You can surprise your enemy with a rocket. So, in this deck up here, my bait deck, I might hold my rocket until the last second. Now, like, let's say it's in sudden death, their tower has um, 450 health left. My rocket does 473 damage to their tower. I won't use it all game until we're right about to get to sudden death. He doesn't know I have it, so he's not ready for it. Or she, possibly. And then, my rocket flies in the air and blows up his or her tower. And it's pretty satisfying. So, that's an example of keeping a card in your pocket. We might call it a pocket card, which means saving a card until a very, you know, um, useful situation. Another example of a pocket card would be hanging onto your golem until you get into sudden death, because he's so expensive it might be too risky to put him down before then. But once you get into sudden death, you've got double elixir, and then, you know, he's a little bit safer to play. Okay, let's go back briefly to my outline here. 
I want to talk about Elixir Trades, Elixir Advantage, BMing, and then I want to close up this video. So an Elixir Trade essentially is spending more or less Elixir than your opponent. A good example to use for Elixir Trade would be the Ice Spirit. Ice Spirit only costs one Elixir. Let's say that he sent in hmm, minions, perfect example. Minions cost three, right? And if minions get to your tower, they actually do a good amount of damage. And if you don't respond to them, they're one of the units that will get to your tower and will hit them if you don't put anything down at all. But you don't want to waste like a three elixir or four elixir on a musketeer um, just to counter their three cost minions that they're sending in. You might want to save your musketeer or your archers or something for later. But you can put your ice spirit down. It only costs one. And now you've countered his three cost unit with your one cost unit. They don't reach your tower. So let's say he had five elixir to start with and you did two. Now he's only got two and you've still got four. Now you know that's a small advantage, right? But those advantages really add up. And they can give you a huge benefit throughout the game. Um, the classic example of a positive elixir trade would be the princess versus the log. In fact, they're both in my bait deck up here. I know I've talked about this already. Princess costs three. Log only costs two. Log instantly kills the princess. As soon as you see a princess, you can roll your log at them or at her, and it'll blow her up. Now, they might do that to bait your log out, so keep that in mind. But if they, if you continually kill their princess with your log, that one elixir positive trade, we'll call it the positive trade, that one elixir advantage adds up. And maybe you know when you've got five elixir and he's got four, it's not a big advantage. But when you have like eight elixir and he or she has like two, that's massive. Then you can put a hog down at their bridge and it'll run across and they won't have enough elixir to, to counter it because they've only got two. They can't put down their tornado or their inferno tower quick enough. And then the hog gets to their tower and just wails on it and does a ton of damage. So there's also negative elixir trades. A quick example of that would be if they send a goblin barrel into your tower and it's almost dead and you're like, oh man, I don't want to lose it. Your only thing in hand that you might have would be a fireball. Fireball costs four. So you might use your four costs to kill their three costs. That's a negative elixir trade because you're losing elixir in a way. That being said, you just saved your tower. So sometimes negative elixir trades are necessary to make especially in things like cycle decks where they're trying to outcycle your counter. You might have to use unconventional counters and do things like negative elixir trades just to kind of stay in the game. All right. So that's pretty much um, elixir trades and having an elixir advantage. Um, an elixir advantage is essentially having more elixir than your opponent, right? So... Of course, if you just plop down a giant or a golem, you're going to have less elixir than them. But they've also got a golem to deal with, so keep that in mind. Alright, let's move on to BMing, and then let's close up this super long video. So, what is BMing? Well, BMing is, uh, I understand that it's bad mannering. Yeah, bad manners. Uh, you might call it bad mouthing, whatever you want to call it. But I've heard other, YouTubes, other YouTubers say bad manners. So what that is in this game is basically when you're sitting there and you're spamming that emote key. Now sometimes that emote key can be pretty fun, right? It's not so bad, it's not so annoying. But man, if you like slip up once and your opponent spams that laugh key and he just laughs and laughs and does the crying face, I mean, I'll admit myself, even I get irked. I mean, I don't want to admit that I get annoyed by a game, but it is a little bit annoying when somebody's there, you know, trying to get under your skin and, and, you know, use that kind of psychological advantage, which some people actually do. You know, some people BM on purpose to try to get under your skin and make you play poorly and win the game doing that. So always keep in mind that you have your, your uh, mute key. So you got a little bit of a mute key on the side of your um, emote key. Um, you check that out in a battle. It's real easy to find. It looks like the little crown with a cross through it, like a red, you know, circle and a cross through it. If you get irked 
by BMing, by somebody seeing their spamming crying face and oops face, and, or the oops text and the angry face and all that, just mute them. If you know it's going to bother you, just mute them right away, every battle. I mean, why let it get to you? Why let it play to your disadvantage? Now, that being said, I'm not trying to say that it's a bad, thi a bad thing to emote. I love emotes. I always do good luck at the beginning of a game. I almost always do good game at the end of a game. Um, I like giving people thumbs up, you know. Some people like doing well played when they see a good play, and that's great. I think that it's cool to have that communication. But BMing is another thing where, you know, you just kind of go overboard. Uh, and that's a term that I think is important to begin, or for beginners. So, lastly, something that I didn't include, but let's add it right now. I'm going to add it to my list. You ready? I think I, think I can do this on the fly, right? What is the meta? Okay, what is the meta? Well, the meta is kind of... Um, if you look it up online or in a dictionary, it might give you a broad definition of it, but it has a particular application in games. And understanding the meta is really important, especially when you push to higher arenas and if you're playing in tournaments, you know, challenges, grand challenges, and classic challenges. So the meta is basically like the overall um, what direction the game is going in, in a sense, and it's often applied to what is popular. So let's look at it that way. What decks and what cards are popular? In the current meta, you see a lot of zap. And I talked about this earlier. It's because there's a lot of zap, uh, a lot of zap because there's a lot of bats, right? Now, before the bats came out, you saw a lot more log. But that changes. The meta shifted. The meta changed. And the meta can change really quickly. It can be overnight. It can be weeks. It can be months. You know, it varies. So right now, in the meta, you see hogs. Hogs are always, almost always very prevalent in the meta. You don't see a lot of lava loon in the current meta as this video is going on. So that shifts all the time. So definitely keep that in mind as you're crafting new decks. A deck that was really good for you for a while, might not necessarily be good at a higher arena, or might have gotten a large nerf after a recent balance change. Okay guys, so that is basically the end of my video. We talked about a whole lot of cool stuff, some major deck archetypes, some minor deck archetypes, some win conditions, what is a win condition, some other really important terminology that I thought would be beneficial for beginners. So, thank you all for tuning in to this super long video. I appreciate everybody's time. Um, if you have any feedback, constructive, um, positive or negative, I shouldn't say negative, I don't want anything negative, um, but something that is positive in a constructive way, I would really appreciate it. So feel free to leave me a comment, and have a good night.